Good morning to everybody. Very good to see you all. I'd like to thank all of our visitors for coming and being with us here today. We know that you didn't have to do that. But you know that the Lord is watching, and you know that it's good for your heart and for your soul. And we do thank you for being here. And to our, our members here, we also uh, want to thank you uh, for, uh, for being here. But uh, we also know that there are a lot of folks that are out of town uh, and, and uh, committed elsewhere. And uh, so with them, we, we wish them Godspeed and, and, a, and a quick return. We uh, have a, a moment or two, if you will, uh, to think about uh, a few things relative to figs, <laughs> to fig trees. I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about figs and fig trees, if you don't mind. As a matter of fact, we have a, a series uh, of, uh, of lessons that have been prepared uh, on this. It's uh, just something I've been, uh, been playing with. As a matter of fact, probably several months ago, maybe half a year ago, uh, I was playing around with uh, such a thing um, uh, and uh, had a chance to kind of do an overview of this. So some of this is kind of from the overview, um, but uh, more specifically uh, related to, to one of the five lessons uh, today. I do appreciate uh, Daryl's prayer relative to living quiet and peaceful lives. Uh, I, I would uh, recommend that you remember that as we go through our, our sermon today. And also, I do appreciate Dave's lesson this morning uh, from the book of Job, because it goes hand in hand. It's actually a very good complimentary uh, lesson to go along with that, because, uh, uh, you know, it's always a little bit better to have some salt and pepper on the table, right? And, uh, and that gives us uh, uh, an opportunity uh, to, to season our food, but more likely and more often uh, with that salt. So let's go ahead and, and consider, if you will, um, the lessons uh, from the fig tree and, and as I kind of broke them out, uh, I, came, I came up with about five. Um, and the first one uh, is about the good life. The second is about shame and modesty. So I know where your mind's going, where it's all taking you now. And you can begin to see uh, these lessons from figs, from fig leaves, and from fig trees. I have another lesson uh, entitled Good, Bad, and Strange. And of course, if you're if you're thinking about fruit, you've ever been to the supermarket or down to the farmer's market and, and, and started looking at inspecting fruit, you'll find some good fruit and some bad fruit. And at times, you'll even find some strange fruit, right? And then also, the fig and the fig tree teaches us that there is a time and a season, right? There is a time and a season, a time and a season for figs, a time and a season for everything. And when that time and season is, is upon you, then, of course, there are certain things that, that can be expected. And, and, and then, of course, we also understand at times that there may be uh, certain aspects in life where we are to be instant in season and in out. And so there's a good contrast there. And the fifth lesson is about fruitfulness, just general fruitfulness, you know, and uh, the lack thereof. So we're not going to go through all five lessons today. Uh, we don't have that, that kind of time. But I would like to go through lesson number one with you today, and that's about the good life. The good life. Heard about it. <laughs> like to think I've been living it. Question is, have you heard about it? Have you been living it? Or maybe you don't think that you have, or maybe you do not think that's worth any value. Well, the first question I would, I would present to you is that what exactly does the good life even look like, right? living that good life. Mama, living that good life. You know, to some maybe it's, you know, uh, I've been taking up a little bit of surf fishing. I can tell you it's kind of nice uh, sitting at the beach with a, with a line in the water, you know, and then just kind of <laughs> sitting back in a beach chair. That, that's, that's living, right? And there's blessings in that, right? And certainly it's a God-provided opportunity and, uh, and one that he would have uh, his children take advantage of and, and find that rest and relaxation uh, and enjoy some of that good life. But maybe there are others that, that feel that they're not enjoying a good life. Life is tough. Life is complex. Life is full of troubles. It's troublesome. It's difficult. Well, some of that may be true. Matter of fact, some of it is true. But is it possible to even endure such things and continue to live a good life? 
Now, Emily and Zach are getting ready to understand what exactly that good life's all about. Their life just got a little bit sweeter. They may not have as much sleep in their future, <laughs> right? But does a lack of sleep mean that you're no longer living the good life? You see, it's how you look at it, how you think about it, right? Now, to some, the good life might look like this. Now, I, it's, it, I have this perspective, right? Some of you have this look of like, what? And others go, I know exactly what that is. So to me, when I was a kid, the good life was having cookies in the pantry, right? You know, if you've got cookies in the pantry, things aren't too bad. You may be having a bad day, but if you can come home and get a cookie out of the pantry, life's pretty good. Life's pretty good. Now, does everybody kind of know what this is? I'm going to kind of let some of you all know what this is. Now, that's the big fig Newton. <laughs> you know, I still got some going. Yeah, I know. And I was going, this guy's weird. But I got to tell you, cookies in the pantry. That's sweet, right? It's all right. Chewy, was it chewy, chewy, rich and gooey on the inside, right? You got that golden, tender, flaky, cakey on the outside. But you know the song, right? And it's, it's good. And it's a, it's, a, it's a nice thing in life, right? To have a couple of cookies in your hand and a glass of milk sitting in your favorite chair, talking with the family, or maybe just letting out the day. There's value in that. There are blessings in that, and they are not to be underestimated. The good life, the sweet life. You ever taken a, uh, a nap in the backyard, in a hammock, under a tree? What allowed you to restfully and peacefully fall asleep? I was dog tired. That's what it was. Yeah. But you're able to fall asleep in the shade, right? Listening to the birds. Maybe a little gentle breeze. And you begin to remove those things from your mind. I don't know, maybe you threw a couple of big newtons in your pocket on the way out the door too. But the good life and the sweet life, that's really why I want to talk about. And believe it or not, this is a scriptural, a biblical principle. And it's symbolized by the fig tree. By the fig tree. You'll find out in the scriptures there'll be uh, certain symbolisms that will relate to olives, and the olive tree, grapes, and the grapevines, figs, and fig trees. Because in the Bible, you'll find that the fig tree represents a symbol of safety, of security, and sustenance. Safety. You feel safe enough to close your eyes. You feel safe enough underneath that tree in that hammock to go ahead and take a nap. Security. Knowing that, that not only are you safe today, but that there's the opportunity there to be safe tomorrow. And to have longevity in that within the family. Within the family. And to have sustenance, right? And if you're sleeping, if you're resting, if you're sitting under the fig tree, there's safety in it, there's security in it, and there's figs just above your head. <laughs> and there's sustenance in it. And the Bible uses this concept of the fig tree and sitting under the fig tree to express those times where folks are living the good life, quiet and peaceful lives. Now, we all know that there are plenty of times in Scripture where, that, where that, those periods were, were quiet and were peaceful. But we also know that there are other times in the Bible that were tumultuous, and folks were afraid to fall asleep under the fig tree. They were afraid that there was no longer security within their family, within their neighborhood, within their nation. 
And there were times where food would be scarce, perhaps maybe even famines and droughts, and not so much fruit hung on that tree. And life's a little tougher. Now, the Lord had always intended such safety, security, and sustenance. And the garden was prepared in such a way that that would be true. If you look in Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, The Lord planted a garden in Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Now that's a backyard I'd like to sit in. The trees, the plants, the shrubs, many of them were beautiful to look at, likely ornate, maybe even flowering. But it also says in the garden there were, there were trees that were good for food. And we start thinking about the types of trees that, are, that were in the garden because we also know that the tree of life was there and the tree of knowledge of good and evil was also there. And trees that were pleasant to the eye and trees that were good for food. Now, other than the two trees that are cited right there relative to the knowledge of good and evil and also the tree of life, do you specifically exactly know what other kind of trees were there? I can tell you one. It was the fig tree. How do you know? Well, when the Lord, when the Heavenly Father set the boundaries for living in the family in the garden, and when those boundaries were breached and disobedience came into the world and sin came into the world and the consequences thereof, when Adam and Eve realized after partaking of that forbidden fruit, if you will, that they were naked and they were ashamed, what did they do? They went to that fig tree. They knew where it was, had likely sat under it many times, and they used the leaves to cover up. That's lesson number two. I'm not going to harp on that anymore today. But we know that the tree, uh, the fig tree was there, and, uh, and Adam and Eve were able to partake of it. And, of course, uh, we know, uh, know the rest there uh, about the boundaries, and I think that's important. And the reason why I say this, because our Heavenly Father... Your Heavenly Father, my Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father provides for His children. Always has, always will. He protects them. He provides for them. And He creates a means for a long and happy life for His offspring, for His children. Dads, fathers, happy Father's Day. I'm glad that you chose to be here today. One message on this Father's Day is that a father provides for his children and he protects his children and he also creates a means for a long and happy life in the family for his children. And for the children who are provided for, who are well protected, and who have this opportunity to have this great relationship within the family and family support, you are blessed and live in the good life. The good life. And you know what? Ask mom and dad. They'll tell you they're living it too. But when things get sideways... Kind of hard to find that good life sometimes. When the provision isn't there, when the protection isn't there, where the ability to have a long and healthy family life isn't there. And instead of following God's design, God's definitions for a good life, we allow the world, the neighbor, the government to tell us what 
is a good life and how to get it. When the good Lord offers it freely to everyone every day, I asked uh, if Psalms 23 could be read uh, today. Psalms 23 to me is a comfort. Uh, I, I, I'm sure it is to many of you as well. Um, the attributes of provision, protection, and uh, longevity are all found within the 23rd Psalm. Seven different ways. You, you, I mean, you can slice it and dice it, and you'll find it all over the place. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Now, I learned, I memorized the 23rd Psalm when I was in fourth grade. It was from my fourth grade teacher in public school. Now, she was a lady of color, smart lady, lovely lady. And she taught several of us the 23rd Psalm in the tumultuous times of the 60s and early 70s. I remember it to this day, sitting under her fig tree, metaphorically speaking. But what a beautiful thing. What a legacy. And we're eating that fruit here today of Psalm 23, Psalm of David that is left for us. Yeah, you can take a look at it there. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Yep, I'm well provided for. My heavenly Father makes sure that I'm well provided for. And I just highlighted a couple of them here. Uh, but it also says a little farther down that I will fear no evil. Why? I sleep good at nights. Why? Because I'm well protected. Well, yeah, I know. You got the Simply Safe on the wall at the house, right? You can turn that on, thing, you know, on every night, and then you're well protected by Simply Safe. But I'll tell you where the, the best safety uh, feature is in terms of uh, uh, house protection it's God. It's God. Now, he doesn't want bad things to happen to you physically. Times they do. But you know what? He's made it such that you have longevity within the family. And spiritually speaking, you don't have to fear anybody that can harm the body. It's the one that can harm the body and soul in hell that you need to fear. Also, the last line says that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, right? That's home, right? Now, there's going to be a, a tree there that we're certainly going to like to, to, um, to be, uh, partake of and be around. Um, but we're all heading back to that eternal, that heavenly garden, right? And that's what we have in mind. But he does this for his name's sake. For his namesake. The scriptures point it out directly. For his namesake. Who is that? That's you. That's me. He loves us that much that he makes that available to us, that he provides that for us. Happy is the person that you can find in many places in the scripture. Blessed is the one that has, well, whose God is the Lord, who has many children in their quiver. Right? Happy is the one. Happy is the person. Let's get a little bit deeper into the subject, if you will, and talk about the fruitfulness of the promised land. Let's consider that time period in Deuteronomy where folks there, the, the Israelites, they had left Egypt. They're heading to the promised land, right? And you can turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 20. I'm going to be pulling from verses 7 and 9. It says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A land of brooks, of water, fountains and springs that flow out of the valleys and the hills. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates. The land of olive oil and honey. A land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. Now that's provision. <laughs> that's provision there, right? And so there they are on the threshold of the promised land, right? Right? And, and you and I might think of things, you know, from, a, you know, from the Middle East perspective, you know, in a cornucopia, right? But, but when you start talking about grapes and olives and figs and dates and nuts and honey and pomegranates, those, that's the good food of life. 
That's the harvest. That's a plentiful, that's an abundant harvest. You and I would look at it this way, right? That would be the modern American way to look at it, right? But, but when you start talking about or listening to those things like that, you're talking about exactly that fine harvest, right? That fount of many blessings, that of outward abundance. God wants good things for you and I. Certainly in the hereafter, amen, but even here, if we're ready to receive it. He's not looking to spoil us such that we become brats and unappreciative, although often we do, and we lose sight of what the good life is. But we also know that if we seek him first in the kingdom of God, then all these things shall be added unto us. That's a true statement. That's not a hypothetical. An inward peace. Good night's rest. Some good sleep. Why? Because you know that you're well protected, you're well provided for, and there's opportunity for a long and happy family life. It's a fun fact about figs. It also has healing qualities. I, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into this too much because it was a fun fact. I found it. i got, I got to put this down or I won't remember it. And, and, and uh, so I just kind of threw it in here. You remember Hezekiah, King Hezekiah? Remember how his life got prolonged? You remember what Isaiah applied to his ulcerated sores? Figs. Figs. A lump of figs. And Hezekiah, at least in part, was, was healed, gained 15 more years of his life. The Father in heaven knows how to provide. You can read that in 2 Kings 20, verses 1 through 7. Certainly in Isaiah as well, 38 and 21. I think about Job. Man, if Job had just had a lump of figs, you know, instead of a, you know, old shard of pottery, you know, scraping on those boils that he had. There are other types of figs, of course. They all, you know, just like apples, there's all kinds of different kinds of apples, but there's also a couple of different kinds of figs. There's the sycamore fig, and the sycamore fig was food for the masses, right? It grew plentifully on the trees, but, you know, the fruit wasn't as tender or as sweet, if you will. Good taste, a little bitter, actually. Um, but it was plentiful, and it was largely food for the herdsman or for, for the, the wayward person, right, the, the, the passerby, if you will, um, for the poor, even. They could go and they gather, and they would the Lord would ensure that they were taken care of, that they had food to eat. But it also meant that there was a place to rally, right? If you're a herdsman, where are you heading? I'm going to that old sycamore tree, right? Got great shade, plenty to eat. I can sit up in it. I can see a good distance, just as Zacchaeus, right? And it's a place where many people know. Matter of fact, Amos, the prophet Amos used to pinch the sycamore fruit. Remember that? Right? And that'd make that fruit, that, that tough bitter fruit, just a little bit more sweet. And I mentioned a little bit about Zacchaeus. It's highly likely that that, that, that sycamore tree, that it was this tree type that he climbed up into when he was looking to see Jesus as he approached. And you can read about that in Luke 19. But let's get back to, to what we're talking about relative to just figs and fig trees. I mentioned it a little bit before. So you talk about the fig tree, think about it. It's a place to eat. It's a place to rest. It's a place to gather. Right? I'll meet you under the, meet you under the fig tree. You might whisper that into your sweetheart's ear. Or you might mention that to your friend. You got something to talk about. But it's a place to gather, a place to meet. It's also a place to reason, a place to meditate and a place to pray under the fig tree. Where's your fig tree? Where's your fig tree? Is it the front porch? Is it the kitchen table? Is it grandma's dining room table? Is it the big shade tree out back that has the swing hanging in it? Is it your favorite coffee shop? Is it your favorite spot in the park? Is that where you go to eat, to rest, 
to meet, to reason, to meditate, to pray. And if you have something like that in your life, you are blessed. You're living the good life. It doesn't mean that there's not adversities, that there's not turmoils. But having a place like that to go to is a beautiful thing. I laid down and I slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Can you imagine taking a restful nap with ten thousand people all around you ready to do you in? Feels like that sometimes when you go to work tomorrow, don't it? Feels like that sometimes out at the mall. Feels like that sometimes around, well, family dinner table. Shouldn't, but sometimes it does. But to acquire that measure of rest, that measure of inner security, requires faith. Faith. If you and I have the faith, we'll find our fig tree and we'll enjoy sitting underneath it. Think about the 12 spies, right? There they are, threshold of the promised land. Let's send them in. Let's scout it out. Let's do a little recon. Then they came to the valley of Eshcol, and there they cut down a branch of one cluster of grapes, and they carried it between the two of them on a pole. Imagine the fruitfulness of, of the promised land, right? And they also brought some pomegranates, and you know what else they brought? They yeah, brought some figs. <laughs> Here's a testament of the abundance of the promised land, and God said it's ours if we have the faith to take it. Did they have the faith to take it? They did not, at least not at first. And that's why they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. All the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, sounds like a bunch of people, don't it? If only we had died in the land of Egypt. Man, thing is just, it's too hard. You know, it's too hard. Can't you just make me a sandwich? It's too hard. You know, what are we having, manna and quail again? Or, if only we had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall victim by the sword? Whose sword? Oh, you haven't you seen? There's like 10,000 Canaanites in there. Our wives and our children, well, they'll become victims. Don't believe that God will provide for them. They do not believe that God will protect them. They do not believe that God has a plan, even though he promised them longevity, that there's longevity in their people. Hey, let's go on back to Egypt. Let's go back there. Let's go backwards and not forwards. There are times and there are seasons to beat your plowshares into swords and your spears from pruning hooks. But there are also times when life is good. And you know how you know when life is really good? is when you're beating your swords into plowshares and your spears into pruning hooks. That's scriptural as well. Micah. <laughs> that was from Micah. Right? Um, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And it's very consistent with the fig tree. And in Micah chapter 4, verse 4 says, Everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree. Here's when you know. The Lord says, when you do all that, life will be good. How good? This is what you'll be able to do. You'll be able to sit under your vine, which will be plentiful. It'll be popping out the fruit. You'll be able to sit underneath your fig tree, you and your family, well protected, well provided for, well sustained, and no one shall make you afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. It has been said, and it will be done. God's blessing of peace and prosperity. And when they took the promised land, and when they survived the period, rebellious period of the judges, and when they went through the early days of the kings, and in the days of Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25 says, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely. 
and each man under his vine and under his fig tree. From Dan to as far as Beersheba, right? From all the way in the north to all the way down in the south. From all the way up to Maine, all the way down to, to South Texas. Everyone sat under their vine and under their fig tree all of the days of Solomon. And life was good. But why then later on did the Israelites fall into Assyrian captivity? And then along came the Babylonian captivity. What happened? What happened to the good life? Did people fail to appreciate it? Did people fail to attribute their good life to the Heavenly Father above? Or did they thump their chest and said, look at all this stuff that I have acquired. Look at everything that I have done or I have inherited or that my family or my, my earthly father gave me or that my government gave me. Attribution for a good life to someone, something other than the heavenly father above? Are you kidding me? Dads, if you protected, well provided, and sustained your children, and they thanked the neighbor's dad, how are you going to feel? Well, why don't you just go on over there and live? And some, many go, you know what? I think I will. And you lose the longevity of the family. You lose the protection and the provision out of a rebellious heart and self-centeredness. I'm going to leave this one to you to go ahead and look at. I, I encourage you later today to read Isaiah 36, verses uh, 1 through 22. You, this is going to be a, a challenge here um, with uh, Sennacherib. And he's going to use the fig tree, just like Satan would use scripture, to bait Christians God's people, children, if you will, at that time, the Israelites, to see if he can't steal them away from God. Hey, I got fig trees too. I'll get you some fig trees if that's all you want. I got front porches. I got kitchen tables. We got coffee shops. We got your favorite spot in the park. Enticements to pull you away, to send you on over to the neighbor's dad. So as we kind of move things towards the end here, I wanted to talk about sharing the good news about the Messiah. Because by the time you start reading Micah, and the time, certainly as the time you start reading about Zechariah, and uh, as David mentioned in previous classes, um, in talking about the branch, the shoot, Right? That's very tree-like, right? Hear, O Joshua, a high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for there are, there are a wondrous sign, and for behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. That's Jesus. This is back in the Old Testament with, with prophecies about returning Israel back to its good standing but also with messianic foreshadowing about the coming Christ, the coming prophet, the coming king. Says the Lord of hosts in Zechariah 3, 8 through 10, I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor. Now that's the way to do it. Why don't you get the neighbors to come on over to your place? Everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. What are they going to talk about? Now, what do you think they're going to talk about? What do you think you and I should talk about when we invite folks over to our kitchen table, to our front porch, to our backyard swing, to our favorite coffee shop, to that place in the park? What is it that you and I should be talking about underneath that metaphorical fig tree? I think it's the branch. I think it's the shoot. I think it's the Messiah. And that's why we're well protected. 
That's why we're well provided for. And that's how there will be longevity in the family of God. All underneath the fig tree. Last little story and then the, uh, the sermon will be yours. So here comes the Messiah. Fast forward to the New Testament. I'm not going to keep you in the Old Testament. Let's get to the New. So here comes Jesus. And guess who's sitting under a tree? It's Nathaniel. Guess what kind of tree he's sitting under? Accident? Don't think so. In John chapter 1, verse 43 through 51, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip. He's calling the apostles, the 12 disciples. He says, I found, uh, and he found Philip and said to me, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida and the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, we found him. We found the Christ. And it's Jesus. And Nathaniel says, well, you know, can anything good come out of Nazareth? There's a whole lesson sermon in that. And Philip said to him, come and see. And Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said to him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. Can that be found of you? Can that be said of you? A Christian in, in whom there is no deceit? Pretty sure Nathaniel spent a lot of time underneath that fig tree. Maybe not that one, but many of them, right? Praying, meditating, talking with God. Maybe speaking with others who knew about God and about this coming one, this coming Christ. Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? And Jesus said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Do you see how far Nathanael went from, from that point to where he said, I saw you under the fig tree, to what happened to Nathanael's heart and his understanding of what was taking place? I have found him. You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Nathanael got it, and we're only in John chapter 1. Wow. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? Apparently he did. But he had no idea. And Jesus says, you will see greater things than these. And he said to him, most assuredly I say to you, hereafter you shall see the heavens open up and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. What am I going to talk about under the fig tree? If I invite my neighbor over to the kitchen table for a sandwich, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about Jesus. What am I going to say? <laughs> There's a whole book of things to talk about. Lots of questions, no doubt. Maybe you have a few yourself. Spend a little time under your fig tree, figure out the answers to those questions, and then share them with other people. So as we wrap things up, my question to you is, are you living the good life? Knowing about what we have talked about this morning, having the greater understanding which God would have us to have, are you living the good life? Maybe you are and you didn't know it. Now you do. Maybe you aren't and wish you were. You can make that happen. Because God wants it to happen for you. Are you living the good life? Because without God, it is impossible. It's impossible. If you don't have God in your life, you're never going to find the good life. There is no utopia out there without God. There is no garden perfect place without God. Safety, security, sustenance, all those things can be available unto you if you choose to live the good life with God. And I challenge you to find your fig tree. If you don't have one, plant one. I'm still speaking metaphorically, you get it, but if you want to plant one in your backyard, go ahead, knock yourself out. Where is that place, that special place for communion in your personal life with God and with others?
The Bible says it's under the fig tree. Find it. Use it. Have meals there. Rest there. Gather there. Reason there. Meditate there. Pray there. And lastly, appreciate. Appreciate the good life. Appreciate it. It's a blessing. Now, it may come at you. It doesn't mean that you're going to be rich. It doesn't mean that you're going to not have any troubles in your life. Two different conversations. It may be that it's a simple life. But it can be a God-filled life. And if it's a God-filled life, then it is an abundant life. Full of outward abundance. If you know how to see things. And full of inward peace if you allow your heart to receive it. So that's all that I have for you this morning. And so as we depart from this fig tree and head out back into into the world, know that God wants a good life for you. He wants a good life for me. And it's ours if we would just hear his word, believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him, repent of our sins, confess Jesus as the Son of God, be baptized for the remission of sins, and then arise to walk in newness of life. There's lots of things to talk about. There might even be questions that you have about what I have here on the slide. Won't you come to sit underneath my fig tree or someone's fig tree here? and respond to such an invitation because that invitation is yours while together we stand and we sing.